I love personal skills. While they're often not the most mechanically impactful aspect of a unit's kit, they do do a very good job of conveying a unit's personality through mechanics, if done right. And sometimes they can allow otherwise overshadowed units to fill really cool niches. For example, despite both being units in the Troubadour class line, the personal skills of Felicia and Dwyer help differentiate them. Felicia's personal skill makes her into a very good support bot for Corrin specifically, whereas Dwyer's personal skill lets you make fun of Nintendo for taking down the 3DS's online features. As a result of my love of this mechanic, I've been theorycrafting hypothetical personal skills for the characters in games that don't have them. The goal isn't necessarily to rebalance or fix these games, as I think they work perfectly fine without personal skills, but more as a fun thought exercise. I've already done skills for Genealogy and Thracia, so I decided to ask my patrons what game they want me to do next, and they voted for Path of Radiance. If you're interested in participating in votes like this in the future, there is a link in the description and the pre-promote tier grants you access to democracy. But of course, only donate if you have the money to do so. Before we get into the personal skills themselves, I do want to go over my general philosophy when coming up with them. I prioritize a skill that can tell a story about a character's personality more so than one that fulfills a mechanical purpose, although if I'm able to do both, that is obviously a double win. I don't necessarily think that every single personal skill needs to be balanced. After all, Intelligence Systems has given us some absolute stinkers like Goodie Basket in the same game as defining skills like Persecution Complex. That said, I will at least try to avoid giving someone a personal skill broken enough to elevate them from F tier to S tier. So sorry Nefany fans, her personal skill is not going to give her plus 12 to all stats, with no condition attached. Lastly, I want to specify again that I don't think the additional personal skills would improve Path of Radiance, but I do think it's interesting to theorycraft what personal skills the cast would have based on their personality as well as things that might help them mechanically. With all of that out of the way, let's dive into my favorite cast in all of Fire Emblem. Ike, Rising Star. Plus 20 hit and plus 2 attack against higher level enemies. Normally I like giving the Lord some form of charisma skill in showing that they inspire all of the allies fighting under them, but Ike is different in that for at least half of the game he's not considered to be a particularly good leader. He actually isn't even in a leadership role until Grail dies, and him being thrust into one causes Shannon and Gautry to abandon him because they question his leadership style. While it is true that some of the people serving under him definitely are inspired by his leadership, there's quite a few others that aren't, and I think that that would be inappropriate, so instead I give him a skill to boost himself to represent that he is still training and trying to become better every step along the way. Titania. Mentorship. Adjacent allies deal plus 1 damage and gain plus 10 hit. I feel like more so than Ike, Titania is really the person who exudes leadership throughout the campaign, and she doesn't really need any help in the combat department since she is already extremely competent, so I figured that her personal skill could help the people around her and reflect that despite being second in command, she's really the one in the leadership role. Oscar. Calm under pressure. Plus 30% hit when below half HP. Oscar is shown to be both the more reliable and level-headed counterpart to his brother Boyd and his fellow cavalier Kieran, so I figured something that boosts reliability, such as giving extra hit, would be a good day to reflect this. The conditional of half HP is just supposed to show that even when in a high pressure situation, he keeps his cool and can be relied on to accomplish whatever you want him to. Boyd. Show off. If the unit is first to act, he deals plus 3 damage at the cost of minus 20 hit. I will fully admit that this personal skill is probably more downside than upside. Boyd doesn't struggle to deal enough damage, instead his accuracy and doubling problems are the things that hold him back. Well, that and the lack of a horse. However, I think it is both funny and very in character that he would want to show off and be willing to do so at a detriment to himself. The plus 3 damage is definitely impressive, but the minus 20 hit is the detriment for him trying to show off. It feels very in character, and because it's only if he's the first person to act, you can usually avoid having to deal with the penalty if you don't need the extra damage, by just having someone else take an action on the turn for him. As a result, I don't necessarily think that it will hurt him, since you can usually avoid triggering it. And either way, for me, flavor is more important than function. Riss. Sickly. If at 50% HP or less, gain plus one move. It is constantly emphasized that Riss is very sickly, and despite this, he wants to take care of others, even though he's really the one who needs taking care of. As a result, I thought him being able to hurry around the field more quickly to heal people when he is at low HP and needs healing very much fits his character. 
Plus one movement is a huge buff, but the 50% HP or less is a pretty difficult to reach condition for a unit as frail as him, and mages have armored move in this game anyway, so it's only going to keep him at pace with the other infantry. I fully admit that Briss is one of my favorite meme characters to use, so it's possible that some amount of favoritism is going into this, but hey, that's half the fun of these. Gatri, Wandering Eye. Take minus one damage, but also suffer minus ten avoid for every female ally within three spaces. The joke about Gatri is that he has an uncontrollable lust and is a serial womanizer, so I thought that giving him a defense boost in terms of him showing off around women would be appropriate, but also the minus 10 avoid is to emphasize that he's distracted by all the women around him and not really paying attention enough to avoid attacks. Either that, or you could interpret it as him intentionally taking hits in order to show how strong he is. Either way, the women being around him make it harder for him to avoid getting hit. Shinon. Opportunist. Plus 10 crit against enemies who cannot counter. Shinon is the exact opposite of someone who would pick a fair fight, so this sort of boost makes sense for him. The plus 10 crit will stack with the inherent crit that he gets from being a sniper, and make him even more of a delete button during the few early chapters where he's actually a viable unit. I don't think it saves his late game, but I don't necessarily think that you need to. Sorin. Gain plus 4 attack speed when at weapon triangle advantage or when dealing effective damage. Soren is the Grail Mercenary's tactician, and so as a result, I think that he should be rewarded for using the correct weapon in the correct situation. Because the magic triangle and 2x effectiveness are usually not especially impactful, I thought that giving him a significant bonus for using them would at least allow you to emphasize his tactical mindset and approach. Of particular note, this might help him against the ravens either to prevent him from being doubled or to allow him to double since he can get effective damage against them with Elwind. Mia, Fierce Rivalry when adjacent to an ally with higher strength, Mia deals bonus damage equal to half of the difference between her strength and the ally's strength. Mia is a bit of a joke character. She's not a particularly strong unit, and yet in the supports she brags about her strength and is constantly seeking a rival to test her sword against. One of the jokes is that she is actually prophesied to have Riss be her rival, despite the fact that he is sickly and can't use a weapon, so I personally think the developers are making fun of how weak she is and she gets upset about that. So this is her way of getting revenge. If someone who is supposed to be her rival is near her, she's going to improve in order to try to surpass them. She's never going to get actually stronger than them, but I think that this at the very least gives her strength from her motivation to get stronger. And that's pretty good, right? Iliana, begging for scraps. If an ally within two tiles uses a consumable healing item, Iliana will also receive the effects. I know that vulneraries and elixirs are not technically food, but this is still a pretty close parallel to her stealing food from people or taking their crumbs and leftovers and whatnot, and I think it's flavorful and fun. Rolf, Deadly Protector. If two or more allies are within three spaces, crit plus 10 and crits do four times damage instead of three times damage. Much of Rolf's dialogue is dedicated to the fact that despite being a child, he's willing to kill people because he wants to protect the people he loves, and he's sick of being left behind while they fight because he always has to worry about them dying when he's not there to protect them. As a result, I think that he would fight harder and better when he's around the people that he's trying to protect. His crit bonus is meant to mirror that of his tutor, Shinon, but their conditionals are different because his conditional is about his motivation for fighting, whereas Shinon's is just about the fact that Shinon is kind of an asshole. Mist. Gentle natured. Recovers from status effects two turns faster. In contrast to Rolf, Mist is shown as very much not wanting to kill enemies. But I don't think that a skill making her combat worse would really be appropriate. After all, these are supposed to be beneficial at least to some extent. As a result, I think making her not be silenced faster allows her to get back to staff botting duties. Ultimately, this isn't going to be super impactful because status is not a big deal in Path of Radiance, but I couldn't really think of anything else for Mist, I'm sorry. If you have a better one for her, feel free to leave it in the comments because I'm really curious what other people come up with around this character. Marsha, Outburst. If hit by a critical hit, Marsha will gain plus three strength until the end of the map does not stack with itself. This is basically a ripoff of Anger Point from Pokemon, but I like it conceptually. She's supposed to be a hothead who gets angry very easily about, well, just about everything. 
Um, so I felt that it fit her. If she ever gets hit by a critical hit, she goes, son of a bitch, and flies into a rage and hits much harder as a result. Very flavorful. Leth, guarded. If untransformed, gain plus 40 avoid against adjacent Bjork. Leth is very much aware of and on guard against the anti laguz prejudices of the world that she lives in, so I think that her being able to avoid attacks from them, in particular when she's untransformed, would be useful and fit her personality. Mordecai. Big Heart. Allies within three spaces gain plus 20 avoid. Enemies within three spaces gain plus 5 avoid. Despite his imposing appearance, the writing goes out of its way to constantly reaffirm that Mordecai is a teddy bear, and in my personal favorite support conversation, it's revealed that he actually covers his eyes whenever he's attacking the enemies because he doesn't want to see anyone get hurt. It's really adorable. Renolf scolds him as this is the reason that you keep missing, but in the end accepts that because he wouldn't want Mordecai to be any other way. Anyway, as a result of that, I thought that giving the enemies a little bit of a void in addition to the allies a void would be flavorful. It's probably going to be annoying from a gameplay perspective, but I just think it's adorable, okay? He has such a big heart, he doesn't even want the red units to get hit. Volk. Blade for Hire. Unit can use the performance bonus skill once per map to spend 1000 gold for plus 2 to all basic stats until end of the map. It always struck me as odd that you hire Volk as a mercenary and yet only have to actually pay him if you make use of his lockpicking skills. He can steal and do combat without any need of spending gold. I thought that an option to spend gold and make him better at both combat and stealing, since strength and speed determine stealing ability, would be potentially a more flavorful way to allow Ike to hire him to perform various duties, in addition to the lockpicking duty of 50 gold. This is definitely the personal skill that comes closest to undermining the game's fundamental mechanics, so I don't know if it'll sit right with everyone, but I think that having a unique interaction to a single character is already pre-established by Tanith being able to reinforce, so I think it's probably fine? I don't know, let me know in the comments. Do you think I'm off base for this one, or does the flavor make up for it? Kieran, Reckless Reputation Allies within three spaces gain plus five critical. People far and wide know Kieran's reputation for being somewhat reckless, and so maybe that reputation inspires them to abandon reliability and instead rely on those sweet, sweet critical hits. Braum, a simple man. This unit ignores the weapon triangle. Look, a simple country bumpkin folk ain't never heard nothing called no weapon triangle advantage. No, uh no way, ain't a thing. Nephany. Practice makes perfect. Doubles weapon experience gains. Nephany is definitely a unit who needs a boost, and I wanted to try to address that with her personal skill. By giving her faster weapon experience gains, she gets out of E-rank hell and can use more powerful weapons to make up for the rather middling stats that she has. Most notably, this would allow her to hit killer lances faster, which synergizes well with her wrath skill. As for an in-world story justification, well, Nephany only just joined the army, and it's made clear that she's not an experienced soldier. I think that by giving her a practice makes perfect skill that helps her grow, it flags her as a project unit and fits with her role within the story. Zihark, Lagu's friend. Lagu's within two tiles of Zihark take minus two damage. Zahark's entire reason for joining you is he wants to protect the Lagoos. With this personal skill, he can do that with an aura of protection. Soth, on the lookout. Plus one vision in Fog of War. Soth is looking for Micaiah, and so it makes sense that he would be very vigilant. Of note, there's only one more Fog of War map after he joins, so this personal skill is almost worthless, but hey, so is Soth, so it fits. Don't worry, buddy, I'll give you a much better personal skill when assigning skills to the Radiant Dawn units. Jill, on the hunt. This unit deals plus three damage to Lagoos. A big part of Jill's arc is overcoming the various prejudices that were hammered into her from childhood. However, during Path of Radiance, she is mostly in the beginning of that arc, only overcoming her racism towards the end of the game. As a result, she is still experienced from her racist Lagoos killing hunts, and so she deals more damage to them. It's kind of messed up, but at least she's trying to be less racist, unlike Shinon. 
From a gameplay perspective, she joins on a map with all Lagoo's enemies, and the following map has some flying Lagoos for her to fight, so it's pretty beneficial to her, I think. Considering she's already one of the best units in the game, it might be a bit too strong, but hopefully not, since it is limited to just Lagoo's enemies and those tend to be rarer. Astrid. Independence. If no allies are adjacent to Astrid, deal plus two damage. Astrid wants to get away from her family and everyone who's trying to protect her and instead make her own as a knight. As a result, I think that she would perform better when she's not next to people who are trying to protect her. Given that she is Kanto, she could easily take advantage of this while ending her turn adjacent to people you want her to be near. So it seems like it's pretty strong, but I don't know, it felt flavorful, so I'm fine with it. Makalov, Clean Getaway. If this unit has a gem in their inventory, plus one movement. Makalov is always trying to run away with money, so this felt like it fits him. It definitely gives him a significant boost, but of the four Cavaliers, I think he's the one that needs it the most. Also of note, he has a red gem in his inventory as an enemy, so if you're dealing with him as a red unit, he gets to make use of his personal skill, which is pretty cool, I think. Stefan. Cooperation. If adjacent to a Bjork and a Laguz, deal plus four damage. As a branded, Stefan is trying to create a society where the branded Bjork and Laguz can all live together. He ends up accomplishing this goal in Radiant Dawn as well, which is pretty cool for a side character most people don't get to see. I wanted to reflect this goal by having him get a boost if he cooperates with people from both races. Plus 4 damage seems like a lot for a unit who is usually doubling and might even proc Astra, but on the flip side, having a Bjork and Laguz adjacent to you is a pretty strict setup condition. It's not unattainable, but it is definitely more demanding than some of the other conditionals, so I think it kind of balances out. In my experience, Stefan's problem isn't that he struggles to deal enough damage, so I'm not sure that this is going to break the game wide open, but it definitely is flavorful. Tormod. Revolutionary. Allied Lagoos within two spaces deal plus two damage. Tormod is the leader of the Lagoos Alliance Liberation Army, and as a result, I think that he wants to inspire the Lagoos to fight for their liberation. A basic damage aura that only affects Lagoos feels appropriate as a result. Mariam. Overprotective. If Tormod is attacked, luck percentage chance that this unit will take damage instead of Tormod. Mariam very much wants to protect his little one, to the extent that he actually pretended he was the leader instead of Tormod to prevent Tormod from getting in trouble. As a result, I think that he should be able to tank for the Frail Mage Boy if you're using both of them. Of course, this does mean that his personal ability is non-existent if you aren't using Tormod, but I think the flavor win is good enough to make up for that. You might have noticed that there is a pattern of me caring more about the flavor than function of these abilities. I just really like it when they tell you a story about the unit. Devdon. Nadved's Friendship. This unit receives and gives double support bonuses. As the resident blackface character, I think the less said about Devdon the better, but Nadved is a fictional character Devdon invents in his support with Largo. As a result, I think doubling the support bonuses kind of fits with the idea that he's getting support from Nadved as well as from his support partner. And that both he and Nadved are giving support bonuses to their support partners. Tanith, Commanding Officer. This unit gains experience from yellow unit combat. The reinforce mechanic is already something unique to Tanith, so I felt that giving her a second personal skill would be a bit overkill. As a result, instead, I decided to just let her gain experience from the yellow units that she summons with Reinforce. This is an extremely minimal thing, as they probably wouldn't get much experience, and she also, like, doesn't really need to grow. She's perfectly fine at base, but it's something. Raisin. Righteous Fury. Adjacent allies deal plus three damage. Raisin is angry, and with good reason, as most of his people were genocided within his lifetime. As a result of him not being able to do combat himself, I thought that boosting other people's combat would be the appropriate way to channel this anger mechanically. Janaf, Hawk King's Eyes. Plus 10 hit when attacking. Ulki, Hawk King's Ears. Plus 10 avoid when attacking. 
I thought that these skills were best talked about in a pair because they are clearly mirrors of each other. Basically, they are the eyes and ears of the Hawk King, and they get minor boosts when attacking due to their powers of observation. These skills are also meant to correspond with Vigilance and Insight, which are kind of personal skills that the Hawks get already. It's just plus 20 hit and plus 20 avoid, and they are also meant to represent the eye and ear observational powers. So I thought a tiny boost to those while attacking or whatever helps, I don't know. These units are weird because they kind of already have personal skills, but I didn't treat Reinforce as a personal skill, and I didn't treat any of the other skills that people start out with, such as Wrath or Smite, as personal skills. So, I don't know. These don't take up capacity. It's really weird. Like, it is really weird, these two skills that they have. I don't know. Khalil. Enchanting Beauty. Males within two tiles take minus two damage. As we can see in her supports with Tormod and Joffrey, as well as the various scenes she has introducing herself in Largo, Khalil very much considers herself to be, among other things, incredibly beautiful. Traditionally, Fire Emblem has associated this trait with Demoselle and Gentle Home-esque effects, where the opposite gender gets some sort of benefit for being within two tiles of them. As such, I decided to give one to her as well. It is definitely a little bit heteronormative, but Khalil also is probably heterosexual as we only ever see her express interest in men and she is not shy about expressing interest when she's interested in someone. I feel like if there were any women she's interested in, we would know. Tyronio. Traditional. Plus four defense and resistance against a foe who is faster than you. Tyronio's support conversations are all pretty interesting, but they tend to focus more on his partners than himself. What little I can glean is that he's been a soldier his whole life and doesn't really know how to do anything else. He's very traditional in that sense. Traditionally, in Fire Emblem, generals have been slow but bulky. As a result, making him bulkier, as long as he is slower than the opponent, felt like the traditional way to approach a general character. Ranulf. Assistance. When untransformed, adjacent allies gain plus two attack and plus two speed. From a story's perspective, Renolf is kind of the second in command to King Canegus. In addition, he tends to take on a helper role in all of his support conversations, helping others embrace their strengths and making them into better fighters. As a result, I felt like him giving a boosting aura to adjacent people when untransformed would give him a job to do when he's not in cat form. For the most part, I wanted the Lagoo's skills to boost them when they're untransformed, since that tends to be when they are at their weakest. Har. Well rested. Use the Wait command to gain plus one to all basic stats until end of turn. I like to think of this as him taking a bit of a cat nap so that he's better prepared for enemy phase. Bastion. Royal Spymaster. Plus ten crit when attacking an enemy who cannot counter. While spies are not a class in Fire Emblem, the closest thing we have is Assassin, and Assassin tend to be a crit-based class. So, since Bastion is the Royal Spy Master, I wanted to give him some extra crit. Lucia. Loyalty. Plus 15 crit if adjacent to Alincia, Bastion, or Joffrey. Swordmaster is also a crit-based class, so I wanted to give Lucia a little bit of crit. She's loyal to the crown, and so she gets that crit if she's near someone who is also associated with the crown. Joffrey. Leadership. All allies have plus 5 hit. This is just a leadership star, but Joffrey is meant to be a good leader and commander on the battlefield, so I figured giving him a leadership star is good enough. Largo. Celebration. Plus 20% to critical hit and proc skills if at 75% HP or less. For Largo, life is just one big party, and I don't know about you, but I consider critical hits and proc skills something to celebrate. Considering how low this guy's defenses are, the HP threshold of 75% or less should not be difficult to reach. Alincia, Royal Authority. Allied units within three tiles gain plus 10 to hit, avoid, crit, and crit avoid. This is just reflavored charisma, and while Ike is definitely not lord enough to get it, Alincia is. I mean, she is quite literally the Crimean princess and becomes queen in the sequel. She definitely has that royal charisma. Anna, Dragon Strategist. Attacks are effective against Lagoos. 
There are a lot of Lagoos on the two maps where Anna is available for, so from a mechanical perspective this is pretty helpful, which is good because she needs the help, she's kind of bad. From a flavor perspective, she is supposed to be a brilliant strategist. This is why she's left behind and why she's Petrine's right-hand woman and all those fun things in the story. With Soren as precedent, I guess I've kind of decided that effective damage is strategy. It makes sense to a degree because you're kind of attacking their weak point. Ignore the fact that effective damage isn't particularly good in Path of Radiance. Uh. Yeah, just ignore that. Effective damage is good strategy, and therefore the strategist gets effective damage. Yeah, no, makes sense. Uh, totally, totally. Nasir. Bjork friend. Bjork within three tiles gain plus two to all basic stats. Much like Stefan, Nasir is trying to mend the relationships between the Bjork and Lagoos. Since he is a Lagoos living amongst the Bjork, he is kind of trying to befriend the Bjork, albeit while hiding his Lagoos nature. As a result, I think that powering up Bjork around him kind of makes sense. You don't get a bunch about Nasir in this game or the sequel, so I kind of had to stretch for a personal skill that reflects him in the story, but I think I did a fairly good job. The only other major trait that we get told about him is his relationship with his granddaughter, and since they literally can't be in the army at the same time as each other, it would be kind of hard to make a personal skill that revolves around their relationship. Gifka, the Shadow. If an adjacent ally has higher stats, copy those stats for as long as that ally is adjacent. Gifka is supposed to be the King's Shadow, so this is a appropriately Shadow-esque thing to do. You take the form of someone next to you. Is it incredibly strong? I mean, I guess, sure, for a unit that is probably never seeing combat, I don't care. Tibarn, the Hawk King. This unit has Kanto. This is a boring skill, but this unit is around for all of two turns, so I wasn't too invested in figuring out a good one for him. Nesala, Maelstorm. This unit can use Wind Tomes. He already has the ability to cast the spell Wind just as a, another one of those weird kind of a personal skill, not really skills, so I figured, fuck it, let him use Wind Tomes. You can trade Elwind onto him, give him Blizzard, Maybe that will make him a semi-viable pick for the Royal. The Royals are so boring. Giving them a personal skill that's never going to see action just was annoying, okay? Nesala can use the Blizzard Tome now. Or you could give him the S-Rank Win Tome if you hack the game and pull it out of the resources. I don't know. <laughs> like, go crazy. I don't know what you want from me. All three of the Royals giving them personal skills just feels like a exercise in nothingness because they're they're present for half of the final map they are such nothing characters oh my god it occurs to me when talking about this actually that none of the mainline games that have had personal skills have had a traditional goto-esque unit a unit who shows up in the final map and is meant to be sort of an anti-softlock feature um so that's kind of interesting I guess that the reason for that, at least in part, is the reason that I think that giving skills to Lagoose Royals is silly. Giving a personal skill to a unit who's just not around for the majority of the game is kind of weird and silly. And uh, it's hard to be invested in coming up with a cool one for a unit that nobody's going to use for an extended portion of time. It's obviously most impactful for the Royals in FE9, since they have the worst availability of any units outside of the Clerics in FE12, but it is definitely a problem to an extent for all Goto-type units. Anyway, that aside, I hope you enjoyed the video. It was a blast to put together. I love theorycrafting these personal skills. And hey, if you've come up with other personal skills that you think are cooler or better than the ones that I came up with, feel free to post them in the comments. I'm genuinely curious what other people think about the personal skills for games that don't have them. Regardless, thank you so much for watching this video to the end, and in particular, a special thank you to my patrons. The Pre-Promote tier, which contains Jamie Collins, Marin Karen, Thick Mulder, George Greenville the 7th, PM, Danielle Kalaskis, and Ania, all voted on this to be the next game that I go over the personal skills of. So there you go. If you want to have a say in what the next next game is, make sure that you uh, check out the Patreon link, which is in the description below. But please only do so if you have the money to do so comfortably.
If you can't afford a Patreon membership, that is perfectly fine. You can show your support by liking the video, commenting below, all of that other stuff. Or if all of that is too much, just have a wonderful day. Stay safe, gamers.